Once you've worked yourself to a place where you're in a senior position, you're extremely well respected, you're, you're, you may be very well paid, but not as well paid as people who are doing the same job, uh, and you recognize that, it's a big risk to, to take a different role and a different tact and, and be willing to speak up for something that people aren't speaking up for. It is. I would say, Shannon, that if I hadn't done it at that moment, I'm not really sure that I would have lived through the next decade. Hi, I'm Shannon Huffman Polson, and I want to welcome you to Facing the Wind, season two of the Grit Factor podcast. We are going to have a great time this season with episodes bringing you experts from around the world in leadership, grit, resilience, purpose, and storytelling. I've listened to you over this last year, your comments, your responses, your conversations, your questions, and this really is a season that has been designed with you in mind. This really is a season that's been designed to answer those questions that you need to know in order to fulfill that mission that I know we have in common, that mission of the Grit Institute, which is building courageous leaders for a better world. We're doing that through our courses online at thegritinstitute.com, through our books, and of course, through this podcast. And if you have a question you'd like to have included, please head over to thegritinstitute.com forward slash podcasts and leave your voicemail. Let's take off. Amy Conway Hatcher is a fierce advocate, lawyer, board director, warrior career mom, and former federal prosecutor. After decades of managing 24-7 crises, climbing to the upper echelons of big law, and sacrificing family for career, Amy did the unthinkable. She left her high-paying equity partner job and an unsustainable climb to reclaim her life. Amy wrote infinitely more to shine a spotlight on systemic workplace inequities that hold women back. Through witty and darkly humorous storytelling, Amy challenges leaders to take bolder actions to fix uneven playing fields while advocating for women to stand firmly in control of their careers. She firmly believes that by sharing our stories, opening our eyes, and being brave enough to have hard conversations, Hashtag, we can do better. Today, a partner in a boutique law firm specializing in complex legal problems, Conway Hatcher thrives as an advocate, author, speaker, and mom of teens. All proceeds of her book are being donated to organizations that support women and girl leaders of the future. All right. Welcome, Amy, to The Grip Factor. It's great to have you on. Thanks. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> it's, it's been a while. It's always good to see you. I'm trying to think about how it is that we met at first and i think it was after the hbr podcast or or the hbr uh, webinar possibly is that right yeah it was the hbr webinar and then i started to do research on you and your background and i found the first book that you wrote not having anything to do with the grid factor but i found the story that you wrote about your dad that was so beautiful and so moving and I remember, you know, I reached out to you because you're writing on leadership issues and that's what I was researching. So there we were, but it just felt like a kindred spirit and a sister, like from the second we said hello. I completely agree. So thank you for that. And I'm so grateful for our continued shared journeys. And then you've had quite, you've had quite a journey the last couple of years. I have, I have, but it's been, you know, it's been good. It's been interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, one of the reasons I thought you your story is is so important on so many different levels and will be for so many people. And one of the biggest reasons is that when we talk about grit and we talk about the grit factor, one of the the misnomers is that we mean that you have to stick with it at all costs, no matter what, and that there's never any other deviation, there's no other path, um, there's no other decision, but you just stick with it. And and there is some aspect of grit that is like that, right, at certain times. But there's also a time, and I sort of think of this as like when to grit and when to quit. And, uh, and quitting is definitely the wrong term, because if it means giving up early, that's certainly not an example of of either grit or what your experience is. But I'd love you to talk a little bit about your experience, maybe first of all, with just the grit piece, the grit of of what it was like to be a corporate lawyer for, for many, many years. So I think sort of some of that is in my DNA, right? Like it, it started when I was young. I grew up in a family where my parents said, 
You have to work for everything you earn and a big emphasis on earn. Nothing's going to get handed to you. Life is tough. Um, you need to make sure that you're sticking up for yourself, that you're working hard. You're not expecting handouts and it's really hard. And if you want something and you have a goal that you have to work really, really hard to get it. And so that was my mindset going in. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't afraid of hard things. Sure. And when I thought of grit with people that I met early on in my career, I was working with homicide victim families. I was working with sex assault victims and survivors, um, kids and women and moms. And, um, and it was really tough. And when I think of like people who had grit, right. those survivors had grit. I was a rookie. I was just learning what it meant to, um, to really sort of dig into your soul and figure out where your inner strength was and to stand up um, and pursue a goal that you had. I pursued a goal that was a job. These people sometimes were pursuing survival. Yeah. And that took that was a whole other level. So I always felt like, um, yeah, it was tough, but I wasn't as tough as some of the people that I met. And I was always really intrigued on what what they did to overcome. So, so I, I don't think I ever viewed myself as having this, you know, monumental understanding of grit or knowledge. I would say people around me who watched my career and who watched, you know, as I had kids and I tried to do it all. Um, they would say I had grit. I don't know that I had as much insight to say that I, that I had as much as they saw, right? Because I was sort of machine doing what my parents taught me, which is working your tail off for everything that you earn um, yeah. and not, not being um, uh, sort of not thinking that your journey was so much harder than anybody else's, if that makes sense. Sure. No, I was brought up very much the same way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but meanwhile, I mean, talk about what, like, what was your typical day, your typical week? So, it, you know, when I didn't have kids, it was, you know, me looking out for, for me and working 24 seven looked totally different than when I had kids. Um, when I had kids, you know, it was waking up at two o'clock in the morning to answer. Um, I, I did corporate investigations. So I, and I, I worked for companies all over the world. Um, a lot of my investigations, you know, I had teams in different places of the world who are working um, at the same time on, on different issues. And so I managed a lot of people. So I'd wake up at two o'clock in the morning where it was my quiet time to think, to answer emails I was never going to get through during the day. Wow. Um, I would try to do a couple of, you know, Europe or um, Asia conference calls if I could get them done before, you know, before people woke up. And then I would move on to, you know, the mom thing. Um, I would try to get my few minutes in that I could with the kids, make sure that the nannies or the au pairs had direction, that I handled all the school forms, you know, and then it was getting in the car and starting my conference calls in the car. Um, continuing that through through work. If I was home and I wasn't on global travel or or domestic travel, um, you know, I wasn't really taking lunch because lunch meant that I might not make it home for dinner, and I wanted those hours at home for dinner. So I'd sort of chug through that, um, and at the end of the day, I'd hopefully get a few you know hours with the kids at dinner time, and then I'd work until um, I couldn't do it anymore, and then I'd start over again. So there were there were really really intense days, and what I would say to you is those were easy. It's like yeah. expected happened, right? When a kid had the stomach flu, or, you right. know, somebody had a meltdown at camp or a parent got sick right. or an au pair had a car accident or, you know, a babysitter didn't show up. Yeah. Um, those were the kinds of things that would upend your day that would make you really, really good at compartmentalizing and multitasking and ball juggling um, wow. and not not really having that. Um, what I say is you sort of don't have this, you have such a razor thin margin of error, yes. right? And so you build your life in the world to work under those circumstances and you can do it for a while. I did it for a long time, but there is a point that you hit that, um, you know, you get to that when to grit or when to, I would say pivot. Pivot. I like that. Yeah. When to grit, yeah. when to pivot. That still has yeah. a a good alliteration to it. Right? It does. It does. And quit works too, because you're, yeah. you're just quitting one thing and you're moving on to something different. Sure. Um, or maybe you're moving to a different organization, but, but there is this, you know, I think it's sort of that check-in with yourself of, is this really working anymore? And what am I doing? 
Right. And and just to, before we get to that pivot piece, there's still some validation, isn't there? There's still some some satisfaction in doing hard things well and, and being recognized for that, right? Oh my God. There's, I mean, it's like a drug, right? It is, it is this adrenaline of you get through a day that nobody, you know, that half the people in the room that you're sitting with couldn't make it through a day that you're making it through. You right. make it through a day like that. And you're like, man, I am a badass. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that on this. <laughs> yeah, no, podcast, you, but, but like, <laughs> you know, you have this, you have this, um, inner strength and, and this badass feeling about yourself in this warrior mode where, um, you feel like you're invincible and then it happens again and again. And man, you get so good at it yes. that there's this incredible sense of validation that comes from managing it all. There's right. also a part where resentment starts to creep in. Yes. Um, so, so you sort of can't forget that either, but there is a, um, a great feeling that comes from that. And I was really good at it. I still yeah. am. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's important to recognize and to honor because it's not a question of, you know, being sent to the salt mines and, and trying to escape. It's uh, it's more finding that validation, finding that sense of accomplishment and doing something really well. Right. And, and knowing you're good at it and being recognized for being good at it. Right. And then things start to shift. Right. That's right. And I think also knowing that you're really good at something that's really hard that yeah. not a lot of people can do. So when you talk about corporate law, I mean, the kinds of things that I dealt with were fraud scandals, bribery, kickbacks, money laundering, right. um, you know, the kinds of things that publicly traded companies and private companies, um, you know, really freak out about because right. it gets their name in the headlines. They're before enforcement regulators in the US and other places. They lose a lot of money. It's their corporate reputation. Right. Everything goes wrong in that minute. And so when you're dealing with people who are in that moment of realizing that there's a major problem in their company, yeah. um, you're dealing with people who are, may never have experienced that heart attack moment before, right. um, or if they have, maybe, you know, they're, or maybe they're in denial that, that it's happening, but you're dealing with very sophisticated people who um, run very sophisticated companies who are really smart, who all of a sudden find out they have cancer. Yeah. And that's a that's a moment that really matters. So if you're somebody who can step into that fold while you're a working mom, you know, a woman working in a male dominated environment yes. and you can actually manage and navigate through, help people navigate through that mess. Sure. Um, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, it must feel like you're helping other people in addition to doing this incredible job, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And there are times where, you know, you also have to have hard conversations with people where you're like, you know, buddy, it's not going to work out that way for you. You can't, you know, tell the FBI to come back another day <laughs> in your lobby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so right. it's, um, you know, there's a reality check that sort of comes with it. And I, I would say that those are, um, those are adrenaline rush days that are, um, they're hard. They're very um, intriguing and interesting and in figuring out the mystery of what makes people you know, do what they do, make decisions they make, good or bad, how they behave, how the systems can show you who's telling the truth and who's lying. Sure. Um, all fascinating stuff. So you're you're in that mode, yes. um, while at the same time, there's a piece of you that's making lunch and um, setting up play dates and, you know, getting people to sports on time and making sure that um, all the different trains are running that have to run. Yeah. 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 So when, when for you did that resentment start to creep into that kind of otherwise pride in the warrior mode? Um, you know, I think that there was, there's probably a tinge of it yeah. that's always a bit there. And sometimes it's a bit incredulous, right? Because you, you have lunch with male peers who you find out are making twice as, that you're making, right? More than twice than you're making. And you realize that uh, maybe you're not being treated equally. Sure. Um, you have um, drinks with folks and you realize they're staying out all night and networking and um, their wives are taking care of everything at home. And if you want to see your kids or you have, you know, obligations, you're not the one who gets to stay. Right. Um, you hear them talk about their golf afternoons and where they got a break. And there are a lot of traditional roles that women have. Sure. Um, on the domestic side, 
that are probably invisible to a lot of people yeah. that people don't see. So, so you, you sort of work alongside people who, you know, it's not always equal, which is fine. Life's not fair. I, I get that. Um, but the way that they talk about their life and some of the easy things that they build in to recover, to, um, uh, you know, regenerate their energy, um, you can't necessarily do. And then you walk in with them to meetings and you see how they might be treated differently than management, where yeah. management turns first to them, but perhaps you're the lead on the team. And so you've got to figure out how to politely navigate through that um, to stand up for who you are and frankly, the role you have on the team sure. while at the same time, you know, um, not step on toes or hurt egos. And so I feel like there is always this sort of accommodation that you have to make. Sure. Um, there are a lot of times where you can shove it under the rug or put it in the closet and ignore it. And you sort of roll your eyes. Um, there does become a time though, where at least it did for me, where it, it became so obvious. And I think where I had challenges, like more major challenges, where it was where uh, the inequities were so blatant yeah. um, and you're with people who you'd had their back for years and then you saw that they didn't speak up. Yeah. And that I had a bigger problem with after a while. Right. And we're talking, you know, 20, 30 years of this. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, both 20 or 30 years of that experience, which which wears on you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, 20 or 30 years of your own incredible experience and contribution, right? So you know you've been contributing for decades at this extremely high level. Right. And yet this continues to happen. Right. And, and the more senior you get, I think the more insidious it can be. Sure. Um, the more annoying it can be when you see it. Sure. Um, and then you, you start scratching your head and banging your head against the wall a little bit and wondering why is everybody so quiet about it? Like, why can't we actually just talk about it and call a spade a spade sure. um, and become better people and create a better environment where everybody feels like they've got a fair shake. Yeah. Um, that, that was a harder, you know, sort of harder thing for me to accept. And I don't know that I saw it. In fact, I resisted seeing it. I talked to people like you, I read your book. I, um, talked to others who had written leadership books. I was writing a leadership book and it right. wasn't really until the middle of it where I was, you know, teaching my kids lessons that we were learning that they would continue to point out to me where I was advocating for less for myself. And that's, that's a really interesting moment. Yes, yes. There is some piece that I, I think uh, is, is hard to articulate precisely, but where being worn down after years and years of this, you, you maybe even though you fight it, you almost start to wonder if you're internalizing it yourself, don't you? Yeah, I, that's where I think the frog in the pot comes into play, right? Like in some ways, we all become a little bit of a frog in the pot because we're we're accepting we're accepting this environment, right? Um, where it, it it we know that there are problems with it, and I'm not talking about sure. casting couch problems. I'm talking about the day to day microaggressions, as biases, and yes. um, and inequities or challenges that women face in the workplace. And some of it I accept because we're all different people and cultures are cultures and you just sort of got to work through it. But, but you're right. It's that pile on effect where um, you find that over time you're speaking up less for yourself and you're speaking up less for others, although as a better advocate for others than myself. Um, and you're becoming a little more like them where you think this is normal and that's the way that it should be because it's the way it's been all along. And if you just work hard enough and you finally get to the decision-making top. Yeah. You'll be able to change it, but you change along the way. Right. And you start to accept more along the way and you start to normalize things that frankly aren't normal and that you didn't think were normal when you walked in the door. Sure. And at some point you decided to make a major change. I did. I did. I, um, <laughs> I left big corporate law. Um, and you know, at the time I did it, I had a um, really tough shoulder surgery. So I was in a lot of pain. My kids were all over me about finally being home. Um, the first chapter of my book, I talk uh, about um, an exchange I had with my son, Jack, who was 12 at the time. And I remember I had other inquiries from other law firms saying, you know, if, you, if you're not happy with your current law firm, would you come up by here? And I was making a lot of money. I was fairly, very high, highly regarded. 
Um, and my son came to see me in the kitchen and he said, you know, mom, you can do what you need to do for your career. I understand that it takes a lot to make a lot of money and to support the family. But the next time I want you to tell that law firm, I want my mom. Um, wow. His point was that he was important too. And what he was getting was the leftovers. Sure. And so, you know, and, and what I was hearing from the firm was everybody has it just as hard. Sure. But I knew they didn't because a lot of the guys that I worked with um, didn't have working spouses. Sure. Um, made a ton more money than some of the women who were, you know, solving some of the same problems. Yes. And they had a lot more to work with, a lot more time to work with. Right. So, so when I decided to leave, I decided to basically go into more of a part-time role where I could, I could decide how I wanted to reconstruct my life and how I wanted to work in the future. Sure. In a way that honored my family, in a way that honored myself, where I could sort of start to recover because I was really, really burned out. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, a couple months after that, that a woman wrote an article for the American Bar Association Journal. It's a, a lot of lawyers would look at this. <laughs> and she said that the reason why women don't, um, don't have upward mobility in law is because when they have babies, they don't work hard enough and they lose focus. And there was a firestorm in response. And I thought, oh my God, I cannot believe we're telling people to do that anymore. And that's really where people said, if you really want to write a leadership book, you need to write about a story behind the surveys that sure. everybody knows is true, that right. so many people are living. And if not you, then who? And sure. so I wrote, that's, that's when I sort of stepped into writing the book and doing a lot more advocacy around gender equity in the workplace. And at home. That's yeah. So, so, so much that is there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's a, once you've worked yourself to a place where you're in a senior position, you're extremely well respected, you're, you're, you may be very well paid, but not as well paid as people who are doing the same job. Uh, and you recognize that it's a big risk to, to take a different role and a different tact and, and be willing to speak up for something that people aren't speaking up for. It is. I would say, Shannon, that if I hadn't done it at that moment, I'm not really sure that I would have lived through the next decade. Mm -hmm. um, my life was, was run on such a razor thin margin. There was so little sleep. There was so much stress. Um, you know, I really wasn't happy anymore. And there was always going to be another crisis. There was always going to be another um, another company that got into trouble. There was always going to be another CEO that needed me on the watch for 20, you know, 24 seven. Sure. Um, and I sort of decided at what point do I choose me? Yeah. Um, and, and I would say that this was probably a long time coming scariest thing I've ever done or second scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but it was necessary. Yeah. And I think that, um, I had, I had done well enough Sure. That at some point you sort of have to ask yourself, what's another year going to do? Sure. And and what was there one specific thing that that made you um, comfortable enough or willing enough to make that decision, or was it just the compilation of everything that at some point there was a, there, there, there was a breaking point? I, you know, I think I think there are a lot of different factors, right? We're like we're in COVID, we're home with our families. I had a case going on where there's one month where I I build a hundred hours a week, so I was home, right? I was sitting with my family at home. I'm in the dining room and I'm not even having dinner with them. Um, it, it was um, it was a case that you know, it, again, like the gift that keeps on giving. So you're bringing a ton of money and you're really successful. I get a raise, I get a bonus. People are really excited, but there was no question about how are you doing, right? right? How is your team doing? Um, is there anything that we can do for you to make it easier, sustainable? When I told them that I was going to, that I was going to take a step back, I did get the questions of, can you go on sabbatical? Can you, um, uh, take a leave of absence, you know, um, what if you go to a reduced schedule for a while? And I kept listening very, very carefully to what were they going to do to change the system, right? Like not just what I take a break and get back on the same field and play the same game in the way I've been playing it. I've been speaking out for a while about 
culture challenges, about sure. leadership communication, about um, you know the the behaviors that you incentivize when you encourage people to bill um, 10, 15, 20 hours a day as a norm, and that's celebrated, right? right? When you're doing that, you're not giving people room to live or communicate in a healthy way or work on teams or learn really important leadership skills. Right. Um, and it seemed like that pressure was increasing, mm -hmm. not decreasing. So I would say the compilation of events, there were a couple of sort of key moments in that fall that created a shift. And I write about that a little bit, Yes. Um, including, you know, an interaction where um, I had asked for support from the firm on something that was pretty important, that was important for their reputation. And the response was, you know, look, you're the client's bitch. Um, you just got to suck it up and do what you got to do. We're really glad we're not wearing your shoes. We are totally behind you and, you know, good luck. But it was just like, do the best you can. Wow. And it's in those. And, and then on the back end of that, I got a, a really nice bottle of um, courage and conviction. Um, 90, I think it was a uh, 90% um, whiskey. It was, <laughs> it, it was pretty crazy. So like, you know, that's what you send a, an extraordinarily busy working mom, um, <laughs> a bottle of like 90 proof booze. <laughs> so, so you sort of get to this point and you're like, um, do you care about the human? Yeah. Right. Is the, is a human relevant to the business, especially high performing humans who happen to be women that you say you want to keep. Yes. And for me, it became the inconsistency of what we say and what we do. Yeah. And it became the lack of courage and integrity in saying that we want to have a positive culture and here are the things that we're going to do to fix it. Sure. In my day job of advising clients and dealing with clients in crisis, I was getting paid 1400 bucks an hour to tell them how to help modify their business to meet the needs of employees, regulators, stakeholders, all of those myriad things that are super important. And they would listen and I would go to home base and it's like, we were different. Yeah. It was, I think it was those inconsistencies that sort of move the needle significantly. I'm sure it was a long time coming, sure. but when it happened, it happened really fast and really intensely. Yeah. Yeah. So since you since you left and since you decided to make this pivot, which is took unbelievable courage and and uh, the ability to confront fear, right? Courage is not the absence of fear, but our willingness to face that fear and to do it anyway. I like to say facing yeah. the wind in the grit factor, as you know, um, so you face the wind and uh, and 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 this resistance is helping you to rise. Um, how is that continuing to play out in the work that you're doing now? And talk a little bit about the book, because it's one thing to leave. It's another thing to write about it. And it's another thing to write about the experience, honestly, about an experience that many people are not willing to talk about. Yeah. And I would say that people like you are the kind of people who give people like me courage to come out and say what they have to say. And the reason is um, not just because you write about it in the grip factor, but because you did it. Mm -hmm. um, you actually lived it. And, and one of the things that I realized in sort of this whole leadership journey is um, you can't go tell people what to do and you can't tell people how to be leaders if you're not willing to step in those shoes yourself and like really earn it, live it, own it um, and be the voice that you're telling other people you want them to be. Yes. So, so I would say that, um, it, that it's been a huge, massive transition. I say the second hardest thing that I ever did was quit or pivot. Yeah. The first hardest thing that I ever did was talking about it. And I had for so many years encouraged whistleblowers and witnesses to be honest um, to step into some really tough shoes and have the courage to tell the truth, even if it meant putting their jobs on the line, even if it meant putting their lives on the line or yeah. their reputations, because saying what really happened mattered to everyone. And of course, you know, if you don't, sometimes in these scenarios, you could get charged for lying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're lying to a federal prosecutor, but, but, you know, the truth really matters. Yeah. And so, so here I was 
you know, all those years telling people to do it, knowing that it took a lot of courage. And, you know, in some cases you really were asking people to put their lives on the line and their jobs on the line, their families on the line. Um, whole different ball game when you're stepping into those shoes yourself and you know that you're opening yourself up to judgment and criticism. Yes. Um, people who wonder, you know, what happened to her at lunch? <laughs> what did she have for lunch? <laughs> that all of a sudden she's, you know, <laughs> talking about the inside story about what happens. Um, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's a, an extraordinary experience to go through it yourself. So what I would say is, um, you know, I'm, I'm still on my journey. Yeah. I'm still writing. I, um, I do a lot of advocacy, um, on LinkedIn. I support women, uh, through their, you know, career struggles. I'm still working part-time in my law job and I'm doing a lot of things at home that I never had a chance to do, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that blows me away is that my, my book started to be eventually became an invitation for people to share their stories. This is sort of the way that, that it sort of resonated with me. Yes. And what's happened is I get flooded with, um, emails, uh, text, DMs, calls from others who have experienced similar things. Right. The thing that you figure out when you go through an experience like this is that you're not alone. And there are a lot of people out there who are uh, above average, well above average, you know, high functioning, high performing people sure. who don't feel like they're seen or heard and who are really struggling. And when, when people wonder why women leave big jobs yeah. or why they don't stay or why they reject you, there's right. a reason. Yeah. Um, and maybe we need to start listening. Maybe we need to start telling each other it's okay to talk. And maybe we need to start listening to those things. So that's sort of what I do day to day. And every day I wonder, you know, like, should I have, should I have had said something at all? You know, does it really matter? Yeah. It never fails. I get a email or a DM in my box from some woman who talks about um, her own experience uh, who thanks me for giving her the space to be able to share it, even if she can only share it privately. Yes. Um, and for some women, how, you know, sharing these stories is, has actually helped them make better decisions with their own career, proactively owning it um, and not being apologetic for making hard choices themselves. Yes. Yes. You know, I, it, uh, among the, the different types of client groups that I work with, they literally span every single industry that you can imagine. And the two that come up that are so interesting are accounting and law, where actually they start out with more women now, right, in mm -hmm. law school and at the yeah. early entry levels in accounting. But by the time they get to the senior levels, there's very, very few, if any, in the partner roles. And, uh, and you've obviously identified some of the reasons for this, but what is the danger in not changing the culture? I know I agree with you on this, but I'd love to hear your words on what's the danger of not making a change. You're starting out with more women than men and you're ending up right. with none. What's going on and how, how can those industries start to address it if they actually are interested in addressing it? Oh, so you, the second part is, is a really important thing to, you know, to ask is, are you really um, interested in changing it? I think the bottom line is, is that everybody sits there and has these meetings about why we can't keep more women and why we can't keep them longer and why we can't get into higher positions. And I was in one of the higher positions. Um, I made it pretty far. I wasn't at the top, but I certainly was in the higher echelon. Yes. Um, and what I would say is if you're not willing to change your playbook, then women aren't going to stay. Sure. They're not going to give you the gift of their intelligence their empathy, their leadership skills, their willingness to do it all. Because yes. there are a lot of women that are willing to give you so much sweat equity, it would shock you yes. how much they're willing to give. Yes. Sometimes for the sacrifice to the sacrifice of their health and their family, which I don't think is a good way to approach it, right. but, but I will tell you they're out there. And if you can't keep them, what does it say about you? Yeah. And, I, and I think at the end of the day, unless people are willing to look in the mirror and read and, and take a look at their playbooks and see how they're running their businesses, um, you know, I, I think I think we're better than that. I think we can be more creative than that. There's something um, there's something more creative than the billable hour. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of like the only thing we've come up with so far. <laughs> um, 
And, and I think there's more that could be done, but I think the bottom line is, is that if you don't change it, then you won't keep women. Yes. Um, the vast majority of the women. And so you're going to have to accept that. And then you're going to have to own it. What I don't like about where we're at is that the expectation is we're all going to lie about it. Yes. And I, I talk about this in the book where I was one of those people who I would walk into, you know, clients and tell them what a great, you know, diversity program we had and how different our form was on women's issues. And really they weren't. And we all knew it. We all, we all knew it was bullshit, right? right? Yet we're doing it because that's the way to play the game. That's how we get in the room. Yeah. Um, but it's not honest and everybody knows about it and everybody talks about it. You know, Amy, I remember talking to a client, this is now a number of years ago in the accounting space. And the question that one of the partners asked was, you know, we really want to bring up this particular woman to be a partner, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, but she's not, she's not accepting the offer. She's, she's not interested. And, you know, what, what should we do about that? And I said, well, what does she say? And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I was just like, have you asked her, you know, have you asked the question, what needs to be different? And it seems yeah. to me that this this idea of just asking the question and then opening the space to listen and be willing to hear something that you might might make you uncomfortable even, right? And and might yeah. challenge your playbook and might and it will in fact challenge the status quo, challenge how it is that you're doing things. But until you ask the question to the people that you're trying to ostensibly bring up into those positions, that there's no hope of of changing the system, right? You're Absolutely right. I, I could not agree with you more. And I think accounting and law are very similar and consulting, I would say, is also sure. very similar um, in the big consulting uh, management consulting firms. Um, I, I think when you think about retaining talent, uh, you sort of have to A, ask them and B, put yourself in their shoes in a way um, and take a look around and wonder what it's going to take to put her in a position of not just getting to the partner level, but let's talk about pay equity because there are a hell of a lot of women that are at the partnership levels. And it's sort of this insidious thing, you know, like once you get to the partnership levels, there are different levels within the partnership levels. Right. So, so you can call somebody a partner but they could be a service partner. They could be the lowest on the tier. And that's where most of the women are like at the bottom end of the partner level. You, know, you see those clusters if you look at the partnership list, but that's all about money and money is power. So my question is, how are you gonna put her in a position where she can make your salary? Yeah. Where she gets your client, right? She competes yes. head to head with you fairly. Yes. Um, and isn't undercut by the system, you or your buddies in an unfair way. I mean, there's healthy competition and then there's sort of ugly competition. Sure. Um, I think where, where people start to lose a little bit of focus is they'll say, I want to make this person, I'm going to keep this number two, right? Like I have this really great number two or number three, I want to keep her. Yeah. Well, if you're going to keep her, you got to make her a number one. Yeah. So what are you doing there, Sparky? And if you're not putting her in a position where uh, she has the ability to compete for your spot, right. then you're not doing her any favors. She might have to leave sure. in order to equally compete with you. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. I, I, I think we're sort of naive too, in how we talk about these issues. So some of it, they don't ask because they don't want to know the real answers. Sure. Um, and they want to stay in control and they want to maintain power and they want to maintain their salary over hers. Right. Um, once you start, you know, going head to head, gets a little tougher. There are some really big egos involved. <laughs> what do you think about the the recent conversations around making pay transparent so that those conversations are on the table from the beginning? I look, I think that people can get so wrapped up in the money side of it um, sure. that I, I get there's resistance to making everything about money. Sure. But I do think transparency is important and um, it brings a whole other level of conversation. I think too often sure. women get undercut on the money and it really does affect everything from stature, from the committees you're asked to serve on, from, you know, how you can manage your, your life, right? Like, because it, in order to be away from home, it costs money to run the household <laughs> yeah. to, to make sure that you can be where you need to be. It's what you wear, you know, are you wearing clothes that are sort of commensurate with the other people that you're standing in the room with? Are you 
um, are you uh, able to join the same country clubs? Sure. You know, yeah. all of those things that put you um, in a position where you're, you're really going um, fairly competing with people, I think the money matters. And that's where I think transparency matters because then we can't have, then we're not going to have these um, sort of sugar coated conversations anymore and say, well, you know, look, you need to wait your turn. It'll happen. Yeah. 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 Um, hang in there. It's tough for everyone. Right. You know, and then, you know, the guy down the hall, who's your, your real peer and age and may maybe you're even ahead of him and the kind of work that you're doing and the revenue you're bringing in. If you see that he's getting more, I mean, I, I just, I think these things happen. I think they happen more often than we think, and we don't pay attention to them. Yeah. But yeah. then women also have to get smarter and women have to negotiate better and they have to have more grit in how they negotiate and have to be fearless, not fearless. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's fear involved. Sure. But I think that we have to own our, our careers in a way that maybe we haven't in the past and not be so reliant on promises yes. that aren't made. Um, Gary Heil, who we both know, yes. at one point said to me, when leaders tell you who they are, you should believe them. Mm. And that's an action and a words. And so when they tell you who they are and they're not delivering on their promises, you should believe them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very well put. I'm a, mm -hmm. a huge fan and I'm so grateful for your introduction of Gary to me. So hopefully he'll listen to this. <laughs> Give his kudos. No, that's so well put. Uh, and uh, and it seems to me that there's a couple of, of things that 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 need the uh, the focus. And one of them is, and I don't know if you can convince actually, or if it's simply the the impact of information that can ultimately convince people that it's not just about do. It is about doing the right thing, right? That's that should be important. But for those for whom it's not important, it's about making sure that everybody has the opportunity to contribute their best selves, right? And if you have a playing field where everybody can contribute their best selves, you're going to get the best out of that. But if you don't have that, then you're only going to get the best from 50% of the population, right? At the end of the Absolutely. day. Absolutely. And then you have to look at your, you know, what is it that you sell? Who are your customers, right? And if your customers have expectations that they're going to see women in the room, you better put women in the room. Yeah. If you're not willing to do these things, then A, you cannot sit there and wring your hands and wonder why women are leaving and why your retention rate is so crappy. Sure. And you also can't um, wonder why you lose clients who decide, I'm not going to do business with you anymore because I told you what I wanted to see sure. and you keep delivering something different yes. or you deliver um, nice faces, but I know they're not in charge. Right. So, so you sort of can't have it both ways. What I would like to see is more transparency on a lot of levels. Um, it, it, you know, salary, yes, but also um, I, I think it has to be, you know, who are you and what do you want? What are the promises you make people when they come in the door? And are you really willing to live by them? And if you're not, or you have other pri priorities, just say it because then you give people the opportunity to choose something different and they might not pick you. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, that's sort of, that's business is business too, right? Truth in advertising. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I just, yeah. I think, I think that we try to sell a pig and a poke and some of us buy into the hope and sure. the dream that it will change. And that finally we've met someone who really cares. Yes. Um, and then it's scary to pivot yeah. and go to a different company or a different position or admit that maybe you made the wrong call. Sure. But that happens a lot. And, and I think people just need to be, say who you are. You want me to say who I am and be authentic. Yeah. How about you try that too? Yeah. 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 No, that's great. See how that I, works out. I like that you pulled out too, that, that women have the, the opportunity and it's too bad that it's, it's a requirement in the way that it is, that is probably more difficult than it would be for a man in this case, but to negotiate and, and be tough in their negotiations and to demand to know what it is that they're walking into. Right. And if you hire a woman to be a negotiator, a good negotiator or service provider, you know, who's, who's going to um, bring in big money for you, then you have to treat her and negotiate with her um, on her own salary in the way that you want to put her out there for somebody else, right? You hire a, um, a, a bulldog and a, and a tough person 
you know, who's going to go and um, bring in more business, then you have to embrace that, you know, at home. I, I, the other inconsistency that I saw was, you know, women, you know, they would bring people in and talk about what great advocates they were and, um, and, and what great lawyers there they were. But then, you know, at home, it'd be like, man, she's tough. What a bitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's sort of, what do you want? Yeah. And if, and if you want someone who's a great trial lawyer, you can't expect her to be a wallflower um, and to be, you know, back at, at, at home, not saying anything right. about how we're running our business. Because it's not just that, you know, it's not like in a company where you're a shareholder, you're a shareholder, sure. but, but here you're a partner. It's a partnership. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of a different business model where you're an owner. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like, again, we have to sort of look at the businesses that we're running, um, look at how we're leading as leaders and what we expect of our people and how we sell our services or products to customers and, and stakeholders and how we make money. Yep. And then to your point, um, you know, women can, women can be um, uh, huge assets in your business revenue. Yeah. And if, and, and in many cases they are, regardless of whether you're male heavy, right? So if you don't treat them that way and treat them as the business owners and the business professionals that they are, right. Then you're going to lose out and you can't, you can't whine when you do. Sure. Sure. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is that I, I think there are, are um, people out there who do want to see change. I think it's both men and women. I think men are raising kids now in different ways, right? They're not, they're not all, uh, you know, our dad's generation and the generation before, uh, even our generation, you know, some of them um, had a di very different worldview of family and what they wanted for their family, the expectations of their wives. I think things have really shifted and they're more partnerships now. Yes. And we're raising our girls to be strong, assertive, um, to uh, want professional careers. Right. We're sending them, the vast majority of them to school. Yeah. Um, so I do think that they're looking at this in a way that what is their daughter going to inherit? And that's, yeah. that's the right question to be asking. So yes. that gives me some hope. And then with women, I think what gives me a lot of hope is that while many are still not comfortable talking about these issues. There are many that are, sure. and that, that group is growing. Um, and I think that as women start talking about their experiences in a way that makes them feel less alone and they start shifting and creating more strategic career planning, you know, groups, right. mastermind groups, kitchen cabinet groups, you know, advisors, um, that really matter. I think you're going to see more women, um, continue to rise, but also stay in the game longer and, and in a healthier way. Yes. Yes. Why? Uh, and I know we only have a couple more minutes, but it, I, I think, I still think it's very hard for women to prioritize their own well-being uh, as much as men seem to uh, be able to do that. And, and I say that actually with great respect for the men who are doing that, because I think we all should do that. Uh, I agree. Why is it so hard for us to do that? I, I don't know. I mean, I was the, the worst at it. Um, there were so many times when people said you can't sustain and I, and I just wouldn't listen. Sure. Um, I think that um, I just don't think we're wired that way. And I think there are times where we're in such survival mode professionally that we end up becoming in survival mode at home and we put everybody before us. I do think that life will happen and kick in the butt and um, at some point you're going to have to come out of that or you're going to wind up in a pretty tough place yourself. Sure. Um, but I think it's something that we need to be talking about. I think we need to be talking about it much earlier in school. We need to be talking about it when women are in college, when they're in graduate programs um, and not in a way that's patronizing about, and there's no such thing I think as work-life balance. I think that's all crap. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there are, are ways to manage our lives in a better way yeah. where we're not forgetting that if we're not healthy and we're not showing up recharged, 
um, we're not doing anybody any favors at home, at work. Um, and that, that's just a unsustainable way of living. Yes. It's really easy, Shannon, though, to get caught up. And, and I don't, I don't think, I think that that's something that will probably struggle for all time because, you know, if you're someone who's a caretaker, whether it's kids or parents or both, sure. um, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. And I think that's the other thing too, is we just have to honor how tough it is. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you for thank sharing you. your lessons, your stories, yourself. I um, am so appreciative of the work that you do in the world and, and just you being in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being an inspiration to me, Shannon. I really, really am truly grateful. That's Facing the Wind, season two of The Grit Factor. Thank you for being here. As always, it's great to have you listening in. And if you enjoyed this episode, would you subscribe, leave us a review and share with a friend? And make sure to pick up your own copy of The Grit Factor for candid stories and lessons from leaders in the vanguards of their fields. If you have a question you'd like to ask, send me a voicemail through the link at my website at thegritinstitute.com forward slash podcast. See you next week.